101.1 The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Alice Bryant and Brian Lynn. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Alice Bryant. We are now 10 months into a pandemic that has changed work-life balance for a lot of people. And many Americans say they are doing well in their home offices and dining room workstations. Most want to continue working from home after the pandemic. Several kinds of businesses that had depended on office workers may be affected. For instance, many office workers attended weekly happy hours or paid for their clothing to be dry cleaned. These are the findings of new studies published by the Pew Research Center and the University of Chicago's Becker Friedman Institute. The Pew study of 5,800 working adults in mid-October found that the change has been easy for most. They have remained productive. And, on balance, it has given people more control over how they use their time. That is different from the common ideas that home offices are full of technical problems and family distractions. Not everyone is happy, of course. More younger workers reported trouble keeping up the desire to work. And parents found it more difficult to work without distractions since many schools are closed due to the pandemic. But even so, the Pew study found, the move to working from home has been relatively easy for many employed adults. Kim Parker, Juliana Horowitz, and Rachel Minkin are Pew researchers. They wrote that the fact that people are doing well working from home may mean a big shift in how the workforce operates in the future. In the coming months, the coronavirus vaccine may force U.S. companies to make a few decisions. These include whether to keep renting office space, let people work where they choose, or make a plan that includes both. It will also answer questions about whether the changes in behavior will stay or go once the risk of being in public has eased. The study published by the Becker Friedman Institute also found that work from home will likely stick. And it estimated that maybe 22% of all workdays will be supplied from home after the pandemic. That is a major shift and, in the future, could affect office building owners as well as eating places. Some experts say that the pandemic's mass social experiment will cut spending in major city centers as much as 10% permanently. They include Nick Bloom of Stanford University, Stephen Davis of the University of Chicago, and Jose Barrero of Mexico's Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo. 
the idea of ignoring work responsibilities from home has disappeared. The technology for performing these duties has improved quickly. And companies and employees have adapted, the research found. Firms have changed their technological setups to help workers do their jobs. And the average worker, the study found, has spent about $660 on equipment for their home setup. Out of 15,000 people who replied from May to October, most said they were as productive at home, if not more so, than they were in their office. And they would like to keep working from home at least two days a week in the future. The dollar value of that is meaningful. Nearly half of workers said the ability to stay home two or three days a week was worth up to 15% of their pay. The two studies shared other common conclusions, including that the ability to work from home is not shared by everyone. Who gets to enjoy work from home? The University of Chicago group found it is mostly men, higher earners, and highly educated workers. I'm Alice Bryant. Researchers from around the world are increasing efforts to find animal populations that could start future human pandemics. The aim is to identify zoonotic diseases, those that can spread from animals to humans. Coronaviruses, for example, can infect both animals and humans. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says coronaviruses, like the new one affecting much of the world, are common in people and many different species. But, the CDC notes, animal coronaviruses rarely infect people and then spread between people. There have, however, been major disease outbreaks caused by coronaviruses in humans. Bats have been linked to some of them. Many scientists believe bats were the first carriers of the new coronavirus, which causes the disease COVID-19. Health experts estimate that thousands of coronaviruses are present in bats, with many still undiscovered. Researchers are seeking to identify such viruses in order to stop new ones from spreading to humans. Dr. Gagandeep Kong is an infectious diseases expert at Christian Medical College, Valor, in southern India. She told the Associated Press, It's not a question of if, but when another virus will jump from animal to human and find the conditions to spread quickly. Kong said earlier research has suggested that India is among the most likely countries for such a spillover event to happen. This is because India has seen its human and livestock populations increasingly expand into dense forest areas where wild animals live. Much of the research aimed at preventing future pandemics has centered on bats, the world's only flying mammals. 
more than 1,400 different bat species live on every continent of the world, except Antarctica. Many of them are effective carriers of disease. This is because the animals can carry viruses that are deadly in humans and livestock while showing little signs of disease themselves. Experts say this permits infected bats to travel long and far with the ability to spread viruses. The secret is that bats have unusual immune systems, and that's related to their ability to fly, Raina Plowright told the AP. She is an expert in infectious diseases and studies bats at Montana State University. Plowright said bats require a huge amount of energy to get off the ground and stay in flight. To do this, their metabolism is raised to a very high level. Plowright and other bat scientists think the animals' bodies went through changes over time to help them recover from the demands of flying. Such changes could also give them extra protection against viruses. Scientists hope to keep studying the bat immune system to help them understand more about what makes the animals lose viruses. Such studies might also help researchers develop future medical treatments. Kara Brook is a disease ecologist at the University of California, Berkeley. She said bats and other animals that carry viruses do not necessarily present a risk to humans. The right conditions have to exist for a spillover event to happen. The virus has to come out of the host for us to get infected, Brooke said. However, she added that the shrinking and destruction of habitats worldwide, especially in forested areas, means we are seeing higher rates of contact between wildlife and humans. Such contact creates more chances for spillover. In Brazil, the state-run Fiocruz Institute sent teams to research bats in Rio de Janeiro's Pedra Branca Park, one of the world's largest forests within a highly populated area. The park was chosen because it offers many interactions between wild animals and thousands of humans living in surrounding communities. The scientists are not only studying bats. They are also studying small primates, wild cats, and cats kept in homes with confirmed COVID-19 cases. The Brazilian team is just one of many worldwide seeking to reduce the risk of a second pandemic this century. Ian McKay is a virus expert at Australia's University of Queensland. He told the AP that scientists and governments would stand a better chance at containing future outbreaks if they had faster messaging of when and where they begin. McKay said ongoing immediate surveillance systems, like flu labs set up by the World Health Organization worldwide, could help researchers be better prepared. He also suggested that labs could continually test wastewater, or materials from hospitals to discover new outbreaks. I'm Brian Lynn. To help protect yourself against the new coronavirus, 
wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water before you eat, after using the toilet, and after touching anything many other people touch, like a seat on a public bus. If you cannot wash your hands with soap and water, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Taking these steps can help prevent not only the new coronavirus disease, but also colds, flu, and other viruses. For more information, visit the following websites. The World Health Organization at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. In our last program, we told you how the flow of immigration to the United States began to change in the 1880s. Before then, most of the immigrants came from Central and Northern Europe, from Britain, Ireland, Germany, and the Scandinavian countries. The largest number came from Britain. They found it easy to settle in a country that, until 1776, was a collection of British colonies. The newcomers from Britain shared the same language with the Americans and many of the same traditions. Some of these early immigrants were skilled workers who found good jobs in American industry. Others were farmers who came to America for free land. Robert Bostick and Jack Weitzel continue the story of immigration in the United States. After 1880, the flood of immigration from Northern and Central Europe began to fall. Now, most immigrants were coming from Eastern and Southern Europe, from Russia, Poland, Romania, Italy, Greece. These new immigrants were different from those who came earlier. Most did not speak English. Most were poor farmers who had few special skills. Most had little or no education. They were, however, good workers. They did not protest working long hours for low pay. They did not demand better working conditions. They usually refused to join labor unions or take part in strikes. American factory owners were pleased with the new immigrants. They gave them jobs formerly held by higher-paid American workers. The owners asked the new workers to write letters to friends still in the old country, urging them to come to America. And they came by the hundreds of thousands to take jobs in steel factories in Pennsylvania and the coal mines of West Virginia. They worked in the lumber camps of Michigan and in the stockyards and the meatpacking plants of Chicago. American workers then began to protest as their jobs were filled by immigrants who were happy to work for less money. The protests were especially bitter on the Pacific coast where thousands of Chinese immigrants were settling in California. The Chinese arrived there after 1850 to help build Western railroads. After the railroads were completed, these Chinese newcomers turned to other jobs. More came every year. By the 1870s, California's political leaders were demanding an end to further immigration from China. In 1882, Congress passed a law 
that barred Chinese immigration for ten years. The law was extended for another ten years, then made permanent. The immigration law of 1882 put other limits on immigration. It closed the country to criminals, the mentally ill, and persons who could not support themselves. Later, others were added to this list. Persons with diseases, anarchists, alcoholics. This, however, did not greatly reduce immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe, and opponents of immigration demanded stronger action. Some proposed a literacy test. Immigrants would have to show that they could read and write. An immigrant who could not would not be permitted to enter the country. Senator Henry Cabot Lodge of Massachusetts urged Congress to pass such a law. In a Senate speech, Lodge said, If we care for the welfare, the wages, or the standard of life of American working men, we should take immediate steps to limit foreign immigration. There is no danger to our working men from the coming of skilled workers or of trained and educated men. But there is a serious danger from the flood of unskilled, ignorant foreign labor. This labor not only takes lower wages, but accepts a standard of living so low that the American working man cannot compete with it. Senator Lodge continued, A literacy test will bear very lightly, if at all, upon English-speaking immigrants or Germans, Scandinavians, and French. The races which would suffer most under a literacy test would be those with which the English-speaking people have never united and who are most different from the great majority of the people of the United States. Congress passed the proposal. President Cleveland, however, vetoed it. He said the nation had nothing to fear from immigrants who could not read or write. He said there was greater danger from some of the educated immigrants who urged violence and anarchy. It took a number of years before Congress was able to pass a law demanding a literacy test for immigrants. Another problem troubled President Cleveland. High tariffs, taxes on imports. Soon after his election, Cleveland decided to learn what he could about the tariff. I'm sorry to say, said Cleveland, but the truth is I know nothing about the tariff. Cleveland studied all the information he could find about the tariff. He found that the tariff was used not only to get money for the government, but to protect American industry from foreign competition. The tariffs had been raised so high that they were producing more money than the government needed. Cleveland decided that high tariffs were wrong. He told other Democratic leaders that he would try to get them reduced. The politicians warned him not to try. They said he would only lose the support of businessmen. They said he would need campaign money from business if he expected to be elected president again. But Cleveland rejected their advice. He said, What is the use of being elected or re-elected if you don't stand for something? So, late in 1887, Cleveland sent a tariff message to Congress. 
He said it was wrong to raise more tax money than the government needed. When this happens, he said, money is withdrawn from the people's use and kept in the public treasury where it does no good. It threatens the economy and invites dishonest attempts to use the money for private interests. The government, he said, received most of this unnecessary tax money from tariffs. He said the present tariff laws were vicious, unfair, and illogical. He said they raised the prices of all imported goods which could be taxed. They also led American manufacturers to raise their prices as high as those charged for imported goods. Cleveland said some men had become rich because protective tariffs let them charge high prices. He noted that American businessmen like to talk about the strength and success of American industry. But he said that when the question of the tariff is raised, businessmen claim that industry is weak. They say they cannot compete with low-priced foreign products. Cleveland said he did not propose that all tariffs be ended. He said some were needed to raise money for the government. And he said some industries could not exist unless they were protected by tariffs. But he said tariffs should not let some industries make huge profits. Cleveland warned that it would be far better to make safe, careful, and intelligent changes in the tariff laws now. Otherwise, he said, there might come a time when an angry public would demand radical and sweeping changes. The House of Representatives moved quickly to pass a moderate bill that would reduce many of the tariffs. The legislation, called the Mills Bill, was exactly what Cleveland wanted. But the bill ran into trouble in the Senate, where Republicans had control. Senator William Allison, a Republican from Iowa, proposed a different tariff bill. It was one that would increase tariffs, not reduce them. The Senate debated the tariff question for months, and since it was 1888, a presidential election year, the tariff became an important election issue. The Democrats promised low tariffs that would mean lower prices for the people. The Republicans defended high tariffs, which they said were necessary to protect American industry and labor. The Democrats nominated Grover Cleveland for another four-year term. The Republicans held their nominating convention two weeks later. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 